I had a pretty bad week uh, starting off. I felt like I had one foot in the grave. Uh, after Sunday night, I have two Bible courses on Sunday night, um, the guys left, and a few hours later, I woke up in like incredible pain, achy. Uh, apparently, there's a stomach flu going around, but I'm not convinced that one of my guys in the Bible course didn't poison me. Uh, Will, there's a lot of suspicious characters. Will is probably one of them, but I don't think he would have poisoned me. I put my, my money on either Stephen O'Neill or Luke Bushman. Um, but anyways, the past, like the beginning of the week, I was just in a delirium for several days. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I fought uh, throwing up for a while. You know, you sort of put up that fight and then you realize, actually, it would probably be better if I did throw up. Uh, and so I had just a series of uh, progressively more intense bouts uh, with uh, the toilet throwing up. I had one uh, extraordinarily aggressive one. Uh, it was in the middle of uh, a rom-com that I decided to watch, and I could tell I was in a delirious state because I would never choose uh, a romantic comedy on Netflix streaming, but I did. Um, and right in the middle of it, it wasn't so bad to interrupt the romantic comedy, but I sort of ran to the bathroom. It was, it was horrible. Uh, my dog was barking. The baby was uh, crying. Susan came in and uh, tried to, and for me, it's sort of holding my proverbial hair back because I don't really have hair. And I, I yelled something like, you, you just have to leave. I can't let you see me like this. Um, and I tried to think about how this would apply somehow to my talk. So I say all these things for a few reasons. First, uh, I may or may not still be feeling a bit pukey. So you all in the second row there may or may not be in the splash zone. Uh, secondly, uh, if anything that I say actually doesn't make sense, I'll just chalk it up to I'm still in a delirious state and the stomach bug is persistent. Uh, and then third and finally, I think I gained a new appreciation for science and religion being sick when I was languishing in the throes of what felt like death. Uh, I appealed to religion. I prayed. and I knew that would bring my soul repose. Uh, and I also appealed to science uh, after, you know, the point where like you throw everything up and then, like, you are trying to throw up, but you can't, and there's, like, nothing left. It's because your stomach's all in flux. So I was like, I need electrolytes. I need Gatorade. Thank you, science, for telling me that. So it was a wonderful lesson in the relationship between science and religion. They get along very well. Thank you very much. So the purpose of my lecture is to make the case uh, tonight that Christianity offers a reasonable, robust, and resilient worldview able to hold its own in the marketplace of ideas. The Christian religion is intellectually tenable, endlessly fascinating, and most importantly, I'm convinced that it's true. In other words, I'm convinced it's the most compelling and satisfying uh, perspective for making sense of the world and our place in it. And as a necessary consequence, I'm convinced that all other worldviews are impoverished in comparison in terms of their explanatory power. And so I'm going to make a case for that tonight. And the specific topic of my lecture uh, and this will be more lectury than sermony, uh, so just because that's what you should expect, I suppose. Uh, the specific topic is religion and science. And the relationship between these two is one of the great debates of our age. It's an overwhelmingly massive topic, so I'm not going to cover everything you're probably hoping I will, so you'll just have to bear with me. But it's a topic that spans dozens of fields, including biology, chemistry, physics, and many of their sub-disciplines like evolutionary biology, astrophysics, and cosmology. And this isn't to mention other relevant topics like mathematics and philosophy. So the topic spans the whole range of space-time and beyond, before time and beyond the horizon of our observable universe, whatever those statements might mean. So it's clearly a massive, mind-blowing topic that would require an entire semester of encounters to actually scratch the surface. But I have just 30 minutes, so here's the little that I hope to accomplish. First, I want to correct at least one commonly held assumption about faith by demonstrating how faith plays a role in both religion and science. And secondly, I want to make the case for Christian theism over and against naturalism by examining two things, human rationality and the nature of the universe. So in just 30 minutes, we're going to tackle the mystery of the human mind and the universe. So I'm going to be moving pretty fast, so buckle in and try to stay with me. So before moving on, uh, I want to say I have three types of students in mind. This lecture is for these three types of people. First, Christians who feel the tension between science and religion. Perhaps you find yourself asking the questions, how can science and religion both be true? Do I need to pick a side? Well, I want to encourage you. The second type of person is Christians who feel no tension between 
science, and religion. Because you've bought into what Stephen Jay Gould calls uh, the idea of non-overlapping magisteria, or noma. This is the idea that science and religion rule their own respective domains. Science rules the turf of facts, and religion the realm of values. The famous atheist and Cambridge professor Richard Dawkins finds this position insupportable. This will likely be the only time I agree with him tonight. He writes, It is incompletely... It is completely unrealistic to claim, as Gould and many others do, that religion keeps itself away from science's turf, restricting itself to morals and values. Religions make existence claims, and this means scientific claims. So if you're in this camp, I hope to correct this line of thinking. And lastly, and probably most importantly for me, is people who aren't Christians. I want to begin removing obstacles to Christianity, and I want to show you that exploring Christianity isn't a fool's errand. And a few more things to note. I'm a theologian and not a scientist. When it comes to science, I'm a layman who reads popular scientific works written for non-specialists. But it shouldn't matter too much because I'm going to be appealing to this debate from a philosophical level primarily. Second, my goal is not originality. I just want to sort of create a broad overview and introduce you all to the topic a bit. And I hope to keep things simple. And I understand that that runs the risk of being overly simplistic. So if you think something I say is incorrect or misguided, please let me know and we can talk about it. My intention in this lecture is not to deliver a definitive final word, but an invitational first word to get a good conversation going. So now on to the first movement of the lecture, correcting a commonly held assumption related to faith. I want to show you that faith plays a pivotal role in both science and religion. But before moving on, we must define our terms. First, what do we mean by faith? Or first, what do we mean by science and religion? And then, what do we mean by faith? Now, both science and religion have two distinct meanings. Science can refer to a body of knowledge claims. And knowledge claims are claims that are simply true or probably true. And science's knowledge claims are about the natural world. And second, this gets kind of confusing because science also refers to the process for acquiring these knowledge claims, and that is the uh, experimentation following the scientific method. Now, religion can also be understood in two different ways. The first way is theology, which is religion's body of knowledge claims about God and his relationship. And uh, the knowledge claims from theology are deduced from intellectual, uh, the intellectual methodical study of what Francis Bacon calls God's two books. These are the books of God's works, creation, and the books Uh, the book of God's word, scripture. And secondly, religion can refer to religious practices or experiences. And these are observances and actions that flow from religious commitments, things like attending church, coming to encounter and praying, etc. Now many think science is based solely on reason, while religion relies purely on faith. But this is not the case. And I want to argue that reason and faith are essential to both religion and science. So what do we mean by faith? Well, here's Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins' definition of faith. He says, Faith means blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. He says, It is a state of mind that leads people to believe something, it doesn't matter what, in the total absence of supporting evidence. If there were good supporting evidence, he writes, then faith would be superfluous, for the evidence would compel us to believe it anyway. And finally, he says, faith is a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence. Now, according to Professor Dawkins, faith is blind trust, it's delusional, and it's unfalsifiable. And if this is what faith actually is, I would join him in criticizing it. But this is not what faith is. In fact, I think this is a gross misrepresentation of faith. I don't know any Christian who holds this idea of faith, and I certainly do not. Alistair McGrath, an Oxford professor with two doctorates, one in molecular biophysics and another in theology, provides a helpful response to Dawkins. First, he says, Dawkins fails to make the critical distinction between the total absence of supporting evidence and the absence of totally supporting evidence. One need not have exhaustive evidence to infer a thing to be true. Second, The scientific method usually produces data that's open to multiple theoretical interpretations. 
leaving open the question of which interpretation is true, an idea that's often expressed uh, as the underdetermination of theory of evidence, or of theory by evidence. An example, which we'll get to later, is how to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. The scientific discoveries of the laws governing the structure of the universe do not compel us, strictly speaking, one way or another. Dawkins is not correct. Faith is not a persistent belief in the face of strong contradictory evidence. Grab a drink here. All right. So what is faith? Well, John Lennox, professor of mathematics and the philosophy of science at Oxford, defines faith in this way. He says, Christian faith is a response to evidence, not a rejoicing in the absence of evidence. The author of the Gospel of John writes this in his biography of Jesus. These things are written, and these things are the story of Jesus, the works and words of Jesus, in order that you might believe. These things were written in order that you might believe. That is, he understands that what he is writing is to be regarded as part of the evidence upon which faith is based. Faith or belief in God is not anti-intellectual, it's not irrational, but is based on evidence. And I've been persuaded that Christianity offers the best way of making sense of the world in which we live, and that's why I believe it, not because it makes me feel good. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. In a similar way that science draws its conclusions based on inferences to the best explanation, so too does religion. God is simply the best explanation to explain the way things are. Now, I concede that the rational arguments of theologians begin from and are bound by data or certain statements held by faith, things like the authority of the scriptures and the truthfulness of the scriptures. In fact, one of the great mottos for religion is Anselm's Fides quaerens intellectum, which means faith-seeking understanding. Though it expresses itself differently, this motto is applicable to science as well as religion. This is because science, too, begins from faith. And what I mean by this is that all scientists necessarily presuppose and therefore have faith in a number of things in order to engage in the process of science. So here are three faith statements or implicit assumptions required by science in order to operate. These are statements that cannot, strictly speaking, be proved true, but without the assumption of their being true, one cannot do science. So the first, belief in the rational intelligibility of the universe that is uniform, regular, and governed by laws. There's no point in exploring how gravitational waves are generated if the laws of physics are constantly changing. And I won't have time to go into this... that it's actually very likely that we're living in a computer simulation. He says, what we experience is a computer simulation based on the laws of mathematics. Our universe might not actually exist. And we might not actually exist. We would simply be virtual minds in a virtual matrix-like world. Our very minds would be simulations, nothing but a network of advanced computer circuits. And the so-called laws of the universe, science discovers, are simply code discovered by us, written by code writers, which he assumes to be superhumans in the future. This sounds totally crazy, but this is actually a thing. And the craziest thing about it is that you cannot prove one way or another whether we're actually experiencing a computer simulation or our universe is real. And finally, belief that our subjective sense perception provides us with reliable information and the ability to process, interpret, and understand them rightly. That is another way of saying to arrive at truth. And I'll pick up on this in just a minute. But for now, I simply want to highlight these three massive faith statements that science requires to operate. And pointing out these implicit assumptions that are ultimately expressions of faith does not negate the truthfulness of scientific knowledge or the reliability of the scientific enterprise. Instead, argues Lawrence Principe, professor of organic chemistry at Johns Hopkins, the reality of these assumptions simply shows that the basis of our knowledge claims are invariably grounded upon certain assumptions that are outside of the realm of reason. This does not imply that they are unreasonable, however. It only shows 
that the exercise of human reason has its limits. The faith claims of science and theology are different, as are the content of their knowledge claims. But the fact of the matter is that both of their methodologies necessarily include faith and reason. And if you doubt theology includes reason, I invite you to read some medieval theology. Uh, I commend to you St. Thomas Aquinas. The Summa would be a good place to start. Though it may seem like science and religion are strange bedfellows, I hope you'll see that this is actually not the case. Science and religion both incorporate faith and reason and seek to explain the world in complementary ways. Christian theism and naturalism, however, are strange bedfellows. And with the uh, introduction of these isms, we're now moving away from science and theology as complementary disciplines to discuss competing worldviews. While science and religion can play along nicely in the sandbox, theism and naturalism simply cannot. They're diametrically opposed to one another. And I'll argue that naturalism is an impoverished worldview in comparison to Christian theism in terms of its explanatory power. So more defining of terms, what do I mean by naturalism and what do I mean by Christian theism? Well, naturalism is not a scientific position, but a philosophical one, one that regards everything that exists or occurs to be conditioned in its existence or occurrence by causal factors within one all-encompassing system of nature. So what does that mean? It means that there's nothing but nature in a closed system of cause and effect. There's nothing outside of nature. The transcendent and supernatural simply do not exist. And the sole kind of reliable knowledge is knowledge that is provided by science. Christian theism, on the other hand, is a philosophical position that regards God to be the ultimate existence. Creation is dependent on God and is conditioned in in its existence by God, by God's act of creation and governance. Now, what does that mean? It means that both the natural and supernatural realms exist. The universe is an open system, but still governed by discoverable and regular laws. And reliable knowledge may be gleaned from a number of disciplines, not just science, but it affirms that all truth is God's truth because truth is derived from and points to God. Now I want to argue that Christian theism provides a better explanation for the way things are than naturalism does. And we'll look at the human mind and the nature of the universe. So first, human rationality. Human rationality is, is just so fundamental to our being in the world that it's taken for granted. In fact, you have to assume it in order to understand what I'm saying right now. We believe or simply assume that our minds work and tell us true things about the world. John Lennox writes that this conviction is so central to all thinking that we cannot even question its validity without assuming it in the first place, since we have to rely on our minds in order to do the questioning. Trusting the cognitive functions of our brain to produce reliable information is foundational to any intellectual activity. But naturalism cannot adequately explain the reliability of our mental processes. Naturalism holds that the human mind is nothing but the brain, and the brain is simply the complex product of a mindless, valueless, unguided process. If this is true, it's hard to see how we can know it's true, because it's hard to see how the brain could produce truth. Thomas Nagel makes this point in his recent book, Mind and Cosmos, and it's got a wonderful subtitle, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Concept of Nature is Almost Certainly False. He's an atheist philosopher, which may be a surprise. He's an atheist philosopher and professor of philosophy of mind at NYU. And in this book, he argues that naturalism provides an insufficient grounding for our confidence in the objective truth of our mathematical and scientific reasoning. Instead, he writes, naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism depends. Charles Darwin himself was aware of the problem. In a letter dated on July 3rd, 1881, Darwin puts it this way. This is called Darwin's Doubt. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or are at all trustworthy. Let me summarize. Naturalism contends that human cognition is nothing but electrochemical signals firing across the neurons in our brains. Our brains may be working chemically, but this doesn't mean that they're working logically. How can we arrive, how can we know we're arriving at truth? Why would we trust that the convictions of our minds are of any value or are trustworthy? 
I don't think I would trust a computer whose assembly was the result of a mindless, valueless, unguided process. At its best, naturalism may lead you to what is useful, useful surviving, useful for surviving, and therefore at utility, but this is not true. With naturalism, truth is pushed over the edge by utility. According to philosopher John Gray, if naturalism is true, the human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Naturalism, in the end, seems to undermine any rational ground for rationality. Christian theism, on the other hand, I think can adequately explain human rationality. Humans are made in the image of God, a rational being, and so endowed with rational intelligence oriented towards truth. Our brains are not the result of a mindless, valueless, unguided process, but are created by God and oriented towards a particular end, namely truth. Now, not only does Christian theism provide an adequate understanding of the human mind, but I'd argue it also provides a more satisfactory ex explanation for the way the universe is. So now on to the nature of the universe. One of the most important contributions of 20th century physics was the discovery of a number of mathematical laws upon which the entire universe depends. These laws are called the constants of nature. Physicists discovered that the existence of everything that exists hinges upon an extraordinarily precise fine-tuning of these fundamental laws or parameters of physics. These numbers are not only intricately calibrated for the universe to exist, but are fine-tuned to sustain life. The gravitational force is neither too strong nor too weak. The ratio of the nuclear strong force to the electromagnetic force is neither too high nor too low. The laws of nature are neither too hot nor too cold, but are just right. This is why Paul Davies, a mathematical physicist and perhaps the leading scholar in the field of cosmology, writes this in an article in the New York Times. We find ourselves in a Goldilocks universe, one that is just right for life. Stephen Hawking's, and it's sort of the obligatory uh, Stephen Hawking's quote for a science uh, lecture, he summarizes it this way. The laws of science, as we know them at present, contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Now, there's some debate about exactly how many numbers are considered constants of nature, but Martin Rees, a pioneer in this field, believes he can boil the constants down to just six numbers, which include the strength of the electrical forces that hold atoms together, the measure of nuclear efficiency, and the number of spatial dimensions, uh, and a few more. Now, to help explain the fine-tuning of the universe, here's an analogy from Martin Rees, the guy I just mentioned. I want you to imagine you're controlling a giant machine that's going to churn out the universe. And I should have uh, a few, okay, here's a, a slide. These are cool old radio dials that I turned into a universe creating machine. So I want you to imagine you're controlling a giant machine, the machine right behind me, that's going to churn out the universe. On this machine are six dials that can, uh, control the calibration of the six numbers that represent the six constants of nature upon which the universe depends. And each of these dials has to be adjusted incredibly precisely to generate a universe that can harbor life. If they're off even by the slightest fraction of a fraction of a fraction, we have no universe. I'll take the gravitational force constant as an example. After the Big Bang, as the matter in the universe was expanding, if gravity were slightly stronger, it would have pulled all the matter in the universe back together into one large mass and would have collapsed back in upon itself. But if gravity were slightly weaker, the matter would have spread out and scattered so widely that no stars could form. Either way, if the gravitational force were tweaked ever so slightly, this would mean no stars. And stars, both large stars, which astronomers call blue giants, or small stars, which are called red dwarfs, both of these are essential for the fundamental building blocks that sustain life, for things like carbon. Without stars, we have no planets, no galaxies, no people, no life. We can also look at the strength of gravity again, this time relative to the electromagnetic force. Both forces, again, are essential in the structure of stars. 
Again, math, uh, mathematical physicist Paul Davies argues that a slight change in the strength of the gravitational force, even by one part in 10 to the 40th, and that's one followed by 40 zeros, one part in 10 to the 40th, slight adjustment would render our universe incapable of life because this universe would either be full of large stars or just small stars, and we need both. One astrophysicist provides an illustration to put this in perspective, because I know these large numbers, it's hard to have any meaning with them. So here is this scenario. Cover the entirety of North America with columns of quarters reaching to the moon, and the moon is roughly 238,000 miles away. Then do the same thing for a billion other continents the same size as America. And then paint one of the quarters red and put it somewhere randomly in those trillions of piles, then blindfold a friend and say you have one shot to find it. Go find it. The chance of your friend finding that one red quarter are roughly 1 in 10 to the 40th. So clearly the gravitational force in the universe has to be tuned to an insanely precise way to permit life. And other such examples abound. Now this is actually a really important discovery for understanding the nature of the universe. And I think it's really relevant for the debate between naturalism and Christian theism. In an interview, uh, the most, or one of the most famous atheists, Christopher Hitchens, noted that of all the arguments that he's ever heard for the existence of God, he and nearly all his atheistic compatriots picked the fine-tuning argument, what I've been talking about, the argument that the universe is fine-tuned for life as the most intriguing. While he doesn't believe it pr proves a design, let alone a designer, he concedes that you have to spend some time thinking about it because it's not trivial. And I take that to be a pretty big deal coming from Christopher Hitchens. Now, there's near universal agreement among the world's top physicists that the observable universe is rendered possible and even inevitable by these constants of nature. But there's disagreement as to why. Why is the world the way it is? Why is it just right for life? And so far as I can tell, the only two plausible explanations for this question are chance and design. So let's look at them. First, chance. The insanely precise degree of fine-tuning of all the constants of nature is a result of chance. This is the move of naturalism. The strongest argument for the fine-tuning being the result of chance is made by appealing to the multiverse. Has anyone heard of the multiverse before in any of your classes? A few people? Okay. So the multiverse, this is the idea that there is not just one universe, but billions, trillions maybe, of universes all having different configurations of settings, rendering some to be successful and some not. Our universe, as a result of chance, simply happens to be one that's fit for life. But there are several weaknesses about this position for explaining our universe. The first is that this isn't a scientific idea. If there are, in fact, other universes, we'll never be able to observe them. Secondly, it also skirts the issue by pushing the question back one step. Who, are made what, who or what made all the universes and engineered their respective laws. Appealing to the multiverse breaks outside the naturalistic paradigm because it requires something outside the system of nature as we know it, namely a mechanism that generates the multiverse. Unlike naturalism, however, Christian theism can adequately account for the fine-tuning of the universe. Christian theism appeals to the other option for explaining it, namely design. The fine-tuning and rational intelligibility of the universe 